Besto Productions presents Creative Continuity at New York Comic Con 2014. Get the latest news directly from comic book artists and writers. Tune in for Creative Continuity's coverage of NYCC. We bring the convention to you. Hi, I'm Mark Aronov here at New York Comic Con, and I'm with Robert Vendetti. Exo Man of War was my first monthly series that I did. It's a story about a uh, fifth century Visigoth growing up in, in the ancient Roman Empire. He gets kidnapped by aliens and taken into space. And he escapes with their highly advanced suit of battle armor when he returns to Earth because of time displacements to modern day. So he's at the same time the most primitive and the most technologically advanced person on the planet. So a lot of his conflicts are derived from applying his fifth century aesthetic to the modern day. That's interesting. So he's basically stuck in the past. Right, but he's in the present. Yeah. So yeah. It, it really, it's kind of a kind of looks at a lot of different things. One of them is like heroism. You know, for example, if you watch a movie like Braveheart, which which is a very famous, very popular movie. Yeah. And you see the scene where he uh, mails the head of the king's cousin to the king, and as viewers, we're like, oh yeah, go get him Braveheart. Yeah. You know? But if somebody would do that today, that would be like you'd go you get prosecuted for war crimes. You know. So how does the nature of heroism change? You know, Eric comes from the fifth century where heroism was was one very specific style of behavior. Now in the modern day, that's evolved into something quite different. He didn't. He wasn't there for the evolving of that. You know, he went into space and came back, and the whole world was different around him. So, how do his ethics and how does he as a character evolve to fit in with a modern society without losing the core aspects that make him who he is? And how do you think he? is feeling about being stuck in the present and not being able to uh, get back to his own time and interacting with the modern people with his... Sure, yeah. They, you know, we're, we just did the 29th issue and then the zero, so we've done 30 issues of the series so far. Yeah. And you know, he's transitioned. You know, he started out, he was very confused, really wanted to go home, didn't understand where he was. It's not even just that the people he knew are gone, the Visigoth culture doesn't even exist anymore. Like, his entire culture has disappeared, not just from the modern day, but even in a lot of ways from history. Like the Visigoth culture, because they were very nomadic during this time period, we don't even really know that much about them. You know, it's a very hard thing to pin down details about. So he was, of course, very alienated, but over time, he's come to understand that this is where he is, and the skill set and the things that he did when he was younger, fighting for the Visigoth people, there are now things that he can do in the modern day to fight and protect the planet as a whole. So he's kind of transitioned but being someone who's alienated and not knowing what their point was and what their purpose was to becoming uh, a defender of Earth in a lot of ways. Yeah. And 30 issues in already, that's mm -hmm. actually quite amazing. Are you excited that you, it's gotten this far? Are you Oh happy? yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was like I say, it was the very first monthly series I ever did. And so every issue that I do is a, is a record in terms of how long I've been <laughs> on the book, you know. I didn't know, not having done serialized comics before, I didn't know how long I would go for it. I mean, year and I run out of ideas two years I don't know you know so we're two and a half in, years in now we already have the next year planned out so it's uh it's one of those things that you're on the book until you run out of ideas they fire you you know and so yeah and bringing up EXO uh how did you come up with the idea of creating this type of story and how did you well uh, the original EXO Man of War was a valid concept from the 1990s so that core idea of him being a Visigoth transported to the modern day that was pre-existing. What we did and what Valiant as a line did when they relaunched was take a lot of these original concepts, stay true to what their core was, but update them and modernize them for today's reader. And so we expanded a lot of Eric's supporting cast, a lot of who his villains are, um, you know, changed the, the nature of the kind of conflicts that, he, that, that he's forced to deal with and uh, do a lot of those things. So I'm working off an original concept created by Jim Shooter and Bob Layton and just sort of uh, building on top of it. I write uh, Green Lantern in, in The Flash for DC, and I also uh, have a intermediate reader uh, children's novel series with Simon and Schuster. Oh, okay. Uh, my first one will be out in uh, June of 2015, and it's called uh, Miles Taylor and the Golden Cape is the name of the series. And the first book is Attack of the Alien Horde. This has been Creative Continuity at New York Comic Con here with Robert Vendetti. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, man. We interrupt our scheduled programming for this report from Harold Gann at RetroCon. Harold Gann here with Morgan Lofting. What got you started? I started in New York in the 70s, and then I got married, and I came out to the West Coast, and 
if you're an actor, you do a little bit of everything. You you try and do on camera commercials, and you do a little bit of television, and you do any voice work that comes along because you need the little odd jobs if you're mm -hmm. not a star, and the opportunity to do a character voices and. Oh my God! I mean, it's so much fun. Wow. Plus, the Baroness always was evil. Much more fun to play evil. Um, and then I would have these personas that I would adopt. Oh. Oh yeah! Don't you? The first show, it's Major Somebody in the very first show, mm -hmm. and I've got the glasses on. I mean, in the in the land of contact lenses, I'm still wearing glasses, and all of a sudden I rip off the mask. And then I am, and I am the Baroness. Yeah. You know, and it was it was just fun. Yeah. Now, now when you got the job, what were what was the uh, the direction as to how to come up with the voice? What type of direction they gave you? Well, okay, when I auditioned for the character, you're handed generally a, a sketch, uh, like a black and white sketch of what they're going to look like, which is extremely helpful. Um, and there was probably a character back uh, background, and they must have said something about an accent. I don't remember exactly what it was, but you read this and you start to get ideas, and then you, you go somewhere out in a field somewhere and you work on your voice because you don't want other actors to hear what you're intending to do. Um, and somehow I came up with this myth of European sound. I have no idea where this came from. There is no country where anybody speaks like this. There really isn't, you know. Um, and then I think the thing that may have clinched it is there was the cobra. And I just let loose with the cobra. You know, and what Mike Bell used to say that there was blood on the control room window when I finished with cobra, you know. And, in the television, you, the voices are, have to compete with the resistor, otherwise they would go Aah! So you never really heard the volume and the depth at which I did Cobra. And I kept thinking, oh God, when they do the movie, can I please, please, please have... And I didn't get to do Cobra in the movie. Aww. I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear it in the movie theater without the restraints on the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. But I think that's what clinched my getting the job. Oh, yeah! I'm always amazed when I meet these people and these characters from 30 years ago are so important to them. I'm, I mean, I'm still amazed. You know, you, you do it, you walk into a studio, you have fun while you're making the show and you're doing the voices and you, you take your money and you go home. And then 30 years later, somebody says, hi, I want you to meet my spouse and my children. And you were so important to me when I was growing up. And you begin to realize that these characters probably help people, right. some people, through, right. you know, moments of their life when they were children. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? It was the sessions were fun. You know, they were crazy. It was all the guys, basically all the guys, because there were much fewer women. And in a recording session, everybody does voices all the time when you're not on camera, when you're not working. You know, every, everybody has the, you know, you have to sound like this, or you have to sound like, hello, person, or you have to, everybody just plays. Mm -hmm. It's like, can you top this? Oh, okay. Oh, all the time. Oh. I mean, oh, yes, it's, it's, it's like turn an actor on and you can't find the off button which is what would happen with Arthur. How long would a session take? Well, Wally used to rehearse a very, very, he always used to rehearse. So a session could go anywhere from maybe four hours to a little bit longer. He would rehearse first before he did the show. Okay. Everybody doesn't do that. Some people you just, you have your script already, you know. Well, you know your character, mm -hmm. but we were still at the beginnings of the show. So a lot of us were, were setting our characters. We kind of had the voice, but we were setting exactly how we were going to interact with the other people. It takes a little while to become comfortable, and then after a while you just turn it on. You oh, know, okay. Don't even think about it, yeah. Right. We knew that our voices, were they were going to take our voices, and they were going to put the animation to our voices. So you know that some of the cartoons, 
you add the voices later after oh. the animation. Wow. Well, that's why you take the the, uh, the anime that comes out of Japan and they add the English voices after. Right, right, but right. They're all they're, you dub in the English. But these, we did the voices and then they went to the animators. They knew what the storyboard was going to look like. And so they had shot, shot, shot. And then they would take our voices and then they would actually create the show. Okay. Afterwards. Yeah. This is how again signing off with Morgan Lofton. Thank you for the interview. You're welcome. All right. Bye. As someone who grew up with the show, yeah, oh, it, it deeply, right. it right. deeply but not, impacted. Not, not back in the 80s, though. You saw it in the 90s, right? I saw it in the 80s. I'm 35. So I was a little boy. Oh my God, you were all right. Yeah. Right, right down there. Yeah, I, yeah, I love the show. I mean, yeah. even a little moral story at the very end. Was yeah. there a moral story at the end? All I sure. remember was you know, don't don't play with matches. And kicking butt, but all right, all right. Well, at the end, they always say, you know, and that knowing is part of the battle. Gee, I do. No, 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 Cobra. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, better be.